Hello, I'm Sofiane Kamoun. I'm a plant pathologist at the Sainsbury Lab in uh, Norwich in the UK. My uh, field is uh, plant pathology. That's because plants get sick and also plants defend themselves against all kinds of pathogens. Today, though, I will tell you not about how plants get sick and how pathogens infect plants, but I'll tell you about a book I read that I find really inspiring. This is a book edited by my colleague, Jean Risteno, shown there in the bottom in, um, of the slide. And uh, she's a professor of plant pathology at North Carolina State University. And this book is about pioneering women in plant pathology. It's a very inspiring book. It's organized in a series of chapters. Each one of them is um, focused on uh, a woman, a woman scientist who uh, was. Uh, an active plant pathologist and contributed to our field in past years. And the dedication of the book is really inspiring and very touching. And the reason for, uh, for this book and the motivation really is to chronicle the life and work of all these ladies who contributed to the science. And often uh, their contributions were not properly documented nor recognized. So it's a very inspiring book to read and, and really great piece of work by um, Jean to edit this book and also all the colleagues who uh, contributed the various chapters. So let me tell you about some of the inspiring stories that were in this uh, book. Some of these inspiring uh, women plant pathologists. One of them will not come as a surprise to uh, those of you who know the field of plant pathology. She's uh, Johanna Westerdijk. She's a Dutch plant pathologist. She's really famous because she started the whole field of essentially of mycology in the Netherlands. She founded the CBS Culture Collection, which still exists until today and actually morphed into an institute. She also founded the Dutch Mycological Society. Johanna, or Hans as she's known, was really famous as a formidable lady who uh, supervised many scientists and really um, contributed to research in many ways notably on studying the famous Dutch elm disease. She's also known as being the first female professor in the Netherlands. She um, was at the University of Utrecht and was appointed professor. And uh, if uh, you happen to be at the University of Utrecht attending one of those public events uh, when PhD students defend and then celebrate their thesis, uh, you will note her portrait there. You can see it there on the bottom left uh, of this series of uh, portraits of famous professors, the only lady on that wall, I think. In, uh, and, and one of the uh, interesting thing they, they did there is you see that small door just below her portrait. So when professors exit the room, they have to bow to Johanna Westerdijk. And I think that's a very touching, touching thing they did at the... Um, out of uh, the University of Utrecht. Now, as I said, Johanna Westerdijk would not surprise you. That wouldn't surprise you to see a chapter on her in this book. But uh, one name may surprise many of you. Those of you who know about biology would definitely know about Rosalind Frank Franklin. <clears throat> Rosalind Franklin um, is famous for having uh, contributed immensely to the uh, discovery of the structure of DNA through her uh, structural biology work and through in particular that photograph 51 that was even uh, displayed in uh, West End uh, Place. This is a photo uh, of me and my team when uh, we were there five years ago uh, in London uh, to, uh, to watch the, the play where uh, Nicole Kidman actually portrayed Rosalind Franklin. Very uh, amazing and really unforgettable uh, uh, day there uh, in London. And um, uh, what is lesser known is that uh, towards the end of her career, uh, Rosalind Franklin worked on tobacco mosaic virus and contributed to understanding the structure of this virus. And you can see that on the right. Uh, that's uh, uh, from her work. And um, Sadly, uh, she worked on TMV, as we call it, tobacco mosaic virus, for about four years. Um, sadly, that was interrupted by her um, uh, untimely death through, uh, through cancer. 
But that's, there's a chapter in this book about Rosaline and um, her contributions to plant pathology are important. So we do, we do uh, adopt her as, as one of our famous female plant pathologists. However, the name I'd like to uh, mention and, and focus on is Eva Sansom. And the reason for that is her story is very touching too, but she's also closest to my field of research. Um, Eva started her uh, science uh, in the 1930s, uh, doing, um, studying plant biology, and that's uh, at that time not, nothing to do with plant pathogens. And her expertise was this field of cytogenetics, which was really budding at the time. And that's the field where you study, essentially you study uh, the genetic material, DNA, chromosomes, using cell biology methods and techniques. And this is some of her early work on uh, P, P sum sativum, uh, dating back to the 1930s. What happened is uh, Eva, who you can see there on the left side of the, that's a photo from the 1960s. Uh, she's uh, apparently a diminutive, formidable lady also. And she uh, moved to Cold Spring Harbor during the war, during World War II. And this is a photo of her at Cold Spring Harbor with the famous Salvatore Luria. So Salvatore Luria is a Nobel Prize winner. He is very famous for his contributions to, um, to microbiology and also uh, to the uh, birth, essentially, of the field of uh, molecular biology. Very early contributions, uh, understanding of bacteria and bacteriophages. So uh, Eva, during her stay at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, she discovered mycology. She was apparently mentored by a Russian uh, scientist who was a mycologist, and he um, taught her all the mycology methods. So when she went back to the UK, and then she went on to have a very rich life, um, living and teaching and working in, in Africa, actually, with her uh, husband, who happened to be a botanist, uh, she continued working on a group of microbes um, who are not exactly fungi, but at the time they were really lumped with the fungi. So this is the group of microbes known as oomycetes. You're probably wondering what's an oomycete. Well, oomycetes uh, include a very famous pathogen, perhaps the most famous plant pathogen of all. This is Phytophthora infestans. Phytophthora is plant killer in Greek. And Phytophthora infestans is the agent of the potato blight and is famous in particular because it's the pathogen that triggered the Irish potato famine in the 1840s. And you can see from this photo that when the potatoes are susceptible and infected by this pathogen, they're totally destroyed by Phytophthora, the plant killer. Well, we now know that oomycetes, like Phytophthora, are not fungi. They look like fungi superficially, and that's why we came up with this t-shirt. Bats are not birds, dolphins are not fish, and all mycetes are not fungi. But from an evolutionary point, and once we understand their biology, we realize that that similarity to fungi is quite superficial and doesn't reflect any evolutionary relationship. They're not closely related to fungi. Well, at the time when Eva was doing her work, that was not fully appreciated. So back in the 70s, um, there was a long debate about the genetic material of oomycetes. Many scientists, notably scientists in the US, um, thought that oomycetes were haploid, just like fungi. And they were biased or by their perspective that these organisms are fungi in their view. What does it mean to be a haploid? A haploid is an organism that has a single copy of every gene in their um, cells. Uh, but many, uh, many organisms, including animals and humans and so on, are diploid. They have actually two copies uh, of every gene or every chromosome in their cells. One comes from one parent and the second copy comes from another parent. Well, what Eva discovered was that all mycetes like Phytophthora are diploid, they're not like the majority of fungi, they're not haploid. And that was quite a debate at the time in the 70s. It was controversial, but her work was really beautiful using the methods of cytogenetics she um, polished uh, since the 1930s. She showed clearly that in the egg cells of uh, Phytophthora, in particular Phytophthora infestans, the potato blight agent, you could clearly see that um, this organism is very likely to be a diploid. 
it really took an, until the 80s before this view was widely accepted and also the fact that homocysts are really distinct from the fungi um, that 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 view was uh, took hold really only in the 1980s a little uh, side story about Eva, when she came back with her husband from Africa, uh, they uh, essentially retired in Norfolk, in this, not far from here, not far from Norwich. And her most famous work actually comes out of her kitchen <laughs> lab, where she did a lot of these experiments in her kitchen. And actually, you can see that in her paper in Nature, her um, address is actually her home address in, in, uh, in uh, this in Norfolk, which is quite an interesting story. Uh, incidentally, she collaborated with uh, Clive Brazier, who at the time was uh, uh, early in his career. He's um, uh, moved on to become also one of our most famous uh, plant pathologists and um, wrote a chapter in the book about, about it. They became really good friends. They didn't stop there. They also showed that some phytophthora can be uh, polyploid, which means they can have more than two copies uh, of every gene in, in their cells. and. Um, this work uh, later on uh, with new methods like genomics, where we can now sequence the genome of every organism, including Phytophthora. Uh, this uh, view that Phytophthora infestans is a diploid and that some strains can also be triploid or tetraploid, multiple copies was confirmed using uh, genomics. So that's a really fantastic pioneering contribution that we all uh, built on. But one sad thing about Eva Sansom is how she was never recognized by institutions, for example, like the Royal Society. She was a bit on the outside of academic research, having worked in Africa and then moved on and done some research out of her kitchen. So um, she never really got the recognition she deserved. And the book talks about that, the chapter from Clive, um, discusses this at the end. She was recognized in some ways, but perhaps not as much as she could have. But then her work stood the test of time and her legacy lives in the research we do today. And this is the greatest honor any scientist can have. Thank you. <laughs>